but thank you very much for this. And um, now I would like to introduce this panel. So we will discuss, uh, I think, a very uh, important issue. So the issue of sanctions and sentencing in the context of domestic implementation and domestication of uh, international criminal justice. I think this topic is uh, its quite symbolic that precisely 75 years ago, the International Military Tribunal rendered not only judgment, but also rendered sentences to the Nazi war criminals. And uh, we know from historians uh, that uh, sentences have been discussed uh, quite uh, uh, quite uh, controversially between the judges. And there was also uh, the issue which uh, arises before each uh, faced each, each of the international tribunals. Quite recently, the, in the case of Ongwen, Dominic Ongwen, uh, we have been witnesses of uh, illuminating discussion between the parties, the defense, the prosecutor, and the victims about the sentence uh, of uh, Mr. Ongven. So this issue uh, is very far from, uh, from full clarity in international criminal law. And I think the, this um, uh, would be very interesting to discuss in this context of interplay between international and uh, national uh, criminal justice. Um, we have a wonderful uh, uh, company. We have a wonderful team of uh, speakers, uh, the input speaker and the disc discussants uh, here. And uh, I think uh, it would be a great discussion. Um, so um, almost all of them are uh, present in, the, in Milan, but uh, we have also uh, Adam Gorski, who is also remote, uh, remote uh, in Krakow. So um, let me first introduce uh, the uh, the main speaker. the The input presentation would be made by Aziz Epik. Uh, uh, Aziz is uh, the uh, research uh, assistant in uh, the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. is a close collaborator of. Professor Sverle and Jesberga, and uh, in his um, in his uh, presentation, he will touch upon the uh, framework, the sentencing framework of the Rome Statute of the ICC, and the general uh, general scheme of the sentencing in international criminal law. So, Aziz, the floor is yours. Uh, please be within uh, twenty minutes, as indicated in the program. Thank you very much uh, and thank you for the invitation to this conference and the opportunity to give this input. In my presentation, I want to focus on the question whether the special character of international crimes warrants a fundamentally different regime of sanctions and sentencing or whether we can refer not mis notwithstanding minor adjustments to the existing domestic legal framework. The German legislator, for example, has opted for the latter. Whilst the VSTGB provides specific sentencing ranges for each crime, section two of the law refers to sentencing judges, refers to sentencing judges to the general sentencing provisions of the German Penal Code. Is that an example to follow or is a separate sentencing framework preferable? In order to give some tentative answers, I will first give an overview of the sentencing framework of the Rome Statute and then Discuss, discuss some issues I find particularly important in the context of domestication. Um, at the outset, it is necessary to consider the purposes of punishment as they influence the process and outcome of sentencing. Interestingly, neither the ICC statute nor the rules of procedure and evidence contain provisions explicitly outlining the sentencing objectives. An analysis of the relevant provisions of the statute and rules, as well as the ICC sentencing decisions to date reveals that the traditional purpose of punishment on which most domestic criminal justice systems rely, apply regardless of the macro criminal character of international crimes and the inherent shortcomings of each purpose with some adjust adjustments, of course. As in the domestic context, it is not a single theory of punishment that justifies and defines international punishment, but a combination of retributive and preventive considerations. The ICC itself has repeatedly identified um, 
retribution and deterrence as primary sentencing objectives, which is in line with the practice of other international courts and tribunals. In addition, positive general prevention as well as rehabilitation are relevant objectives, even though less weight is attached to them by the court. With regard to the main uh, two main sentencing objectives, the ICC judges clearly view retribution as closely linked to the expressive capacity of punishment on the one hand, and as demanding proportionate sentences on the other, while the term deterrence refers to both general and special deterrence. Whether the ICC's approach is convincing is of course subject of ongoing debates, but I will just stick to this um, very br uh, brief overview. With regard to the applicable penalties, the Rome Statute includes a single provision determining the penalties that apply uniformly to all four core crimes and their respective individual acts, Article 77. According to this provision, the ICC may impose either imprisonment for a specified number of years, which may not exceed a maximum of 30 years, or a term of life imprisonment. In addition, but not in, instead of, punish, of imprisonment, Article 77.2 of the ICC statute allows the court to order a fine or a forfeiture of proceeds, property and assets derived directly or indirectly from the crime. Thus, the principal penalty is imprisonment. Interestingly, the statute establishes also a clear relationship um, of rule and exception in favor of fixed term imprisonment as a sentence of life imprisonment is only admissible when justified by the extreme gravity of the crime and the individual circumstances of the convicted person. This is confirmed uh, by rule 145.3 of the rules of procedure and evidence, um, according to which life imprisonment will generally only be justified if at least one aggravating circumstance under rule 145 exists. By not imposing any mandatory life sentences for particular crimes, the ICC statute actually ensures that the court is always able to impose a sentence that actually reflects the crime and the perpetrator. The determination of the sentence in a particular case is governed by a number of provisions in the statute and the rules. Read together, these provisions establish a rather comprehensive sentencing framework. First, any sentencing decision has to comply with the overarching principle of proportionality. This follows from articles 81 and 83 of the statute, according to which a sentence may only be successfully appealed if the sentence is disproportionate to the crime. In addition, rule 145 of the rules of procedure and evidence provides that the totality of any sentence must reflect the culpability of the convicted person. The degree of culpability sets the frame for any uh, uh, sentencing considerations and bar sentences that are detached from the individual responsibility of the perpetrator for the harm caused by his or her crimes. In Lubanga, the appeals chamber explained that proportionality is generally measured by the degree of, of harm caused by the crime and the culpability of the perpetrator. And in this regard relates to the determination of the length of the sentence. With a view to the specific sentencing factors, Article 78 of the ICC statute lists the gravity of the crime and the individual circumstances of the convicted person as the primary sentencing factors, while Rule 145 lists further relevant sentencing factors and provides a list of mitigating and aggravating circumstances that the court shall take into account as appropriate. I think I will refrain, given uh, the time constraints, from going into very much detail regarding the gravity concept and also uh, regarding the particular um, elements of rule 145. I think it is just important um, uh, um, to remind us of uh, the fact that the gravity of the crime is measured in abstract on the one hand by analyzing the constituent elements of the crime and in concreto in light of the particular circumstance of the case and of course um, we have to uh, consider both um, uh, the, the uh, gravity of the crime as an objective element and, of course, also the gravity of the convicted person's culpable conduct. Um, 
With regard to the individual uh, circumstances of the convicted person, uh, it is important uh, um, to consider um, not only uh, the personal situation of the offender, such as his age or his socioeconomic background, as I mentioned in Rule 145 as well, um, but also um, preventive uh, objectives of sentencing, for example, the risk of recidivism or the prospect of reintegration into society. Once the judges have identified all relevant factors, they have to determine the, um, their weight in a particular case. And then of course, um, they will have to balance them against each other to determine a sentence that is proportionate and reflective of the offender's culpability, and then have to pronounce a sentence for each crime. And of course, a joint uh, sentence whenever there are um, uh, uh, more, whenever there is more than one crime the perpetrator is convicted of. What uh, is important uh, in the domestic context then? With regard to the purpose of punishment, if we follow uh, uh, the, the approach that transfers the um, domestic purpose of punishment, if we so want, um, then of course we don't need any um, special framework in the domestic context. Um, as Italian courts already have to consider a variety of sentencing objectives, and as Italian law also demands proportionality between the crime and the sentence, as far as I understood it at least, um, and also stresses the principle of personal culpability, major adjustment do not seem imperative. However, um, and we might touch upon this uh, later on, it might merit consideration whether the weight attached to the respective sentencing objectives domestically needs to be reviewed uh, in light of the discussion at the international level. With a view to the applicable penalties, the general gravity of crimes under international law is a strong argument in favor of custodial sentences. Imprisonment should therefore be the primary penalty for all core crimes. Pecuniary sanctions could of course be considered as additional sanctions, but will rarely be adequate on their own. The Italian penal code also includes provisions on civil sanctions. It seems sensible to apply these provisions to crimes under international law as well. Um, as the reparations regime of the Rome Statute demonstrates, the compensation of victims is an important element of the overall legal reaction to international crimes. Um, let us now turn uh, to the need for and the design of sentencing ranges for each crime. The principle, of, the principle of legal certainty demands that the form and scope of possible penalties is determined by law. While this principle is construed less strictly in international criminal law, so that the general sentencing uh, range provided in the Rome Statute is not considered problematic, most domestic legal systems, including the Italian, are much stricter in this regard. Therefore, the legislator is obliged to provide specific sentencing ranges for every crime. But how should such ranges be determined? First, I submit that as a general rule, it does not seem appropriate to classify the core crimes or their underlying acts merely as contraventions in the Italian criminal law categories. Again, so far as I've understood it correctly. This follows from a comparison between the underlying acts of the core crimes and the corresponding ordinary crimes. Even war crimes against property uh, supposedly the least grave crimes in the Rome Statute as the relatively low sentences for pillaging, for example, in Ongwen uh, have uh, confirmed once again, um, would equate at least to a delict under Article 635 of the Italian Penal Code. Given the international dimension of crimes under international law, it would be inconsistent to classify such crimes as contraventions rather than delicts. Second, when considering appropriate sentencing ranges for crimes under international law, it should be kept in mind that there will rarely be a case where the perpetrator's actions do not simultaneously fulfill the elements of ordinary crimes or where he or she will not have committed ordinary crimes in addition to crimes under international law. Against this backdrop, it could be useful to take the sentencing ranges of relevant ordinary crimes as reference, po as reference points when dis deciding on the ranges for crimes under international law. Third, the sentencing ranges should reflect that there exists, in my view, a hierarchy of crimes between the core crimes, as well as a gradation between the underlying acts of each core crime. 
I cannot set out my arguments uh, in this short presentation, but I am of the opinion that even though all core crimes can be described as the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, the gradation of the core crimes of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes based on the wrongfulness of these crimes can be established by analyzing the objective and subjective elements of each crime and by taking into account their respective contextual elements. Such an analysis reveals, in my view, that the crime encompassing the highest degree of wrongfulness is genocide followed by crimes against humanity and war crimes, of course, all else being equal. Fourth, the principle of personal culpability requires a careful consideration of the appropriate lower and upper limits of the respective sentencing ranges, as the principle demands that the punishment adequately reflects the guilt of the offender as defined by his or her individual responsibility for the harm done. The most important consequence of this principle is that the courts must be in a position to meet out sentences that are actually reflective of the perpetrator's individual uh, culpability. In this regard, mandatory life sentences tend to be problematic. This might sound counterintuitive as we regard international crimes as the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. However, it is of utmost importance that the seriousness of the crimes is not automatically equated with the individual culpability of the offender given the macro criminal context in which the individuals act. In particular, international crimes are often committed by a collective of perpetrators that includes perpetrators of different hierarchical ranks. While they might all be considered as principal perpetrators from a doctrinal point of view, the varying degrees of responsibility that can be attributed to them need to be considered. Therefore, it must be taken into account what role an individual had in the commission of the crime, to what extent he or she is responsible for the overall harm, and to what extent he or she acted, acted under circumstances that reduce his or her guilt, such as duress-like situations, acting under the impact of massive propaganda and neutralizing mechanisms, or under the pressure of superior orders. To this end, a certain degree of judicial discretion is indispensable. In the domestic context, it is even more important to keep these considerations in mind, given that mostly lower and mid rank defendants will be prosecuted before national courts. Finally, the principle of complementarity is of relevance. It has been argued in the literature that the unwillingness of a state to generally carry out an investigation or prosecution, or its intent to shield a person from criminal responsibility, which would trigger the ICC's jurisdiction, can be assumed if perpetrators of international crimes systematically receive disproportionately lenient sentences. Sentencing ranges therefore need to reflect the seriousness of such crimes. At the same time, states do have a large margin of appreciation in their legislative decisions, given that there are vastly different sentencing traditions and cultures and um, also uh, in particular, the Rome Statute does not oblige states uh, to implement its provisions into domestic law. A state's unwillingness can therefore not be determined based on the numerical difference between the maximum terms of imprisonment provided for in the Rome Statute, for example, and the domestic law respectively. Rather, the emphasis should be placed on the relation between the sentencing ranges provided for crimes under international law on the one and ordinary crimes on the other hand. Whether the domestic law provides for appropriate sentencing ranges is therefore a question that can only be answered by relative comparison within the same legal system. My remarks on the sentencing factors that should be included in a provision on sentencing for international crimes will be very short. So far as I understand Article uh, 133 of the Italian Penal Code, the gravity of the crime and the offender's capacity to commit the crime are the two central sentencing criteria. The factors that judges need to take into account in determining the two criteria are based on a plain reading of the text, quite similar to those referred to in Article 78 and Rule 145. Without going into any detail and with the caveat that I'm obviously not an expert uh, in Italian sentencing law, it appears to me that Article 133 of the Penal Code would generally be a suitable provision in order to determine appropriate sentences for crimes 
under international law. At least the factors included in the provision are very similar to those that need to be considered by the ICC's judges in their determination of an appropriate sentence. So long as Article 133 does not limit the judges in their consideration of other relevant factors, I do not see an urgent need to change or replace it for the purpose of sentencing for international crimes. We should also bear in mind that um, uh, what I have mentioned earlier, as most of the time, judges will have to meet out sentences for ordinary crimes and international crimes at once. It would complicate their task significantly if they had to apply a significantly different sentencing framework. In conclusion, in my view, the most intricate task for the legislator in the determination of, adequate, um, um, of an adequate framework are the sentencing ranges. Um, but uh, the rest of the framework is probably very suitable. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Epic, for uh, this input. Um, I also thank you for, for the great timing. Um, so now we return to our discussion. So we have we have five uh, five speakers, and I uh, would like to remind uh, everyone that we have uh, extreme time pressure. So we we have natural interest, at least uh, offline participants, to to complete this uh, this day and to 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 enjoy uh, to enjoy evening. So um, I ask everybody to keep um, strictly within uh, seven, maximum eight minutes. So uh, optimally uh, seven minutes for each, uh, for each speaker. And um, I would like to first to invite um, Dr. Uh, Paola Caroli, who's uh, also a researcher, postdoctoral researcher in the Humboldt uh, Universität zu Berlin uh, to make, uh, to make a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Adzid, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, first of all, let me take 10 seconds to, to join the others, thanking Professor Meloni and Professor Yesberger for organizing this conference, and of course, Maria for her contribution. Um, so I would like uh, to start by saying some preliminary remarks and say that a discussion on the implementation of the Rome Statute in Italy in 2021 cannot and must be the not, not the same discussion that we would have had right after the introduction of the statute. In fact, after the euphoria of the late 90s, implementing the Rome Statute in 2021 must consider the current difficult situation that we all know the ICC is experiencing and the possible future scenarios of international criminal law. Probably in the mind of the drafters of the statute back in 1998, the future of international criminal law was meant to correspond only to the uh, ICC. Uh, today, it is clear to everybody that this is very unlikely. On the contrary, the future of international criminal law will probably look more like a polyphony, as suggested by Mireille de Masmarty, an archipelago of, of islands which emerge among the different and opposing ocean currents. So international criminal law in the future will be broader than the Rome Statute in terms, first of all, of levels of judicial intervention with a major role of national jurisdictions and regional organizations, but also in terms of a response, not only retributive justice, but also mixed models that include amnesty and restorative justice, just like in the Colombian case but also in terms of object, including prob probably ecocide, as we have already discussed, environmental crimes, and even transnational economic crimes, such as corruption, interpreted as human rights violation. And in the end, even in terms of perpetrators, overcoming the limitation to individuals and including corporate responsibility. Of course, you may say that this complexity is already to be seen today, but it is likely to grow in the long-term future. So why am I mentioning all this as an introduction? 
because I think that the awareness of this scenario should have repercussions on the choices we make regarding sentencing in this implementation process. In particular, I would like to discuss the possible role of policy considerations in the sentencing phase, which could exceptionally break the logical consecutiveness between adjudication and punishment. Um, so what do I mean by this, uh, by this breaking this consecutiveness, which is also a translation of an expression uh, of Professor Di Martino. Uh, as you all know, it's very debated whether international crimes should be the object of a duty to punish. Many scholars infer the existence of a duty to punish and consequently that such duty is unavoidable by means of an amnesty from the duty to prosecute, which is established by various international treaties, as we all know. As underlined by Ronald's lie, the model of the criminal prosecution is composed of three phases, investigations, adjudication, and punishment. The analysis of the admissibility of the amnesty, therefore, involves a reflection on the relationship between the second and the third phases. The promoters of restorative justice dwell upon the space between adjudication and punishment. On the contrary, for example, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, but even some resolutions of the General Assembly of the UN and part of the scholarship seem to suggest an inseparability of the two terms. Only if we adhere to this last conception must we necessarily interpret the duty to prosecute as a duty to prosecute and punish. As you all know, the ICC statute does not introduce for the states a declared duty to punish, as it does not mention neither clemency nor restorative justice. On the contrary, it allows a certain degree of discretion to the prosecutor and to the court as well, as ultimately to the United Nations uh, Security Council pursuant to, the, to Article 16. In particular, Article 53.1c provides that prior to the opening of a single case, the prosecutor should have the possibility not to, not to open an investigation despite the presence of all the condition for the intervention of the court, if by taking into account the gravity of the crime and the interests of the victims, there are nonetheless substantial reasons to believe that an investigation would not serve the interests of justice. This very controversial formula was probably meant to represent an outlet for the system in the light of policy considerations. The need for prosecutorial discretion seems to be confirmed in some recent decisions in the situations of Libya and Afghanistan. Now, having said all that, and bringing this to our implementation and to the Italian national level, I think we should ask ourselves, is such a space for policy consideration in relation to international crimes should and could be given to the national prosecutor before bringing the case to trial? So just like in the ICC model. Do note that, on the contrary, in Italy, the national prosecutor has a constitutional obligation to open investigation and to bring the case to trial. But in a different perspective, a space for policy consideration could instead come afterwards and be left to the judge after the adjudication. I am referring to the possibility of introducing the separation between the judgment and the sentencing, and at the same time, giving the judge the power to ascertain the criminal responsibility of the accused, but to decide not to apply any sanction. Of course, this exceptional power should be provided with specific guiding criteria, such as the participation of the accused in a restorative justice mechanism where he agrees to confront with the victims or the commitment to the mobilization of paramilitary groups, guarantees of no repetition, or even maybe the age of the accused and the time passed between the commission of the crime and the judgment. 
These would combine both the judicial search for truth and a communicative function of retributive justice on the one hand, with forward-looking goals proper of restorative justice on the other. I think that the dialogue between the international and the national dim dimension should be bilateral. I think that the Italian criminal law system could provide, uh, provide an important contribution by extending to international crimes its long tradition in relation to systemic crimes, in particular organized crimes. I'm thinking, first of all, about the so-called diritto penale premiale, which refers to benefits in case of collaboration of the accused. I should also mention the, the particular attention for the victim of organized crime in the light of the long Italian tradition of par civil. At the same time, Italy has both practical experience and a wide scholarship regarding victim offender mediation and an opening up of the criminal trial to restorative mechanism. These tools are particularly relevant in juvenile crimes, but are also to be found in adult criminal law and are likely to grow in the very short time on the basis of the work of the Latanzi Commission and the following legislation uh, delegation law, which was adopted one, year, uh, one week ago by the Senate and encourages the use of restorative justice both during the trial and during the I, I think we, we are out of time, please. Continue. Okay, uh, okay, so just one, one last sentence. So I just want like to conclude by saying that this bilateral dialogue could pave the way for a more complex and heuristic response, which in my opinion should not be limited only to retributive international criminal justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this intervention. And I, I now invite uh, our second uh, speaker, uh, our second discussant, uh, Professor uh, Emilia Fronza uh, from University of Bologna. So the floor is yours, please. Thanks, Professor. Yeah, so thanks, Professor Bokush. Thanks, Aziz, for your presentation. And of course, a special thank to Chantal. Doesn't work? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, and a special thank to Chantal and uh, Florian, and of course, Maria, for having organized um, this important colleague. So, moving on to our panel's topic reflecting on sanctions and sentencing is um, both crucial and complex. This is true on many levels, including the articulated geography typical of international criminal justice divided between the universal and the local. It is precisely within this geography that implementation must be situated. In this sense, it is an opportunity to conform prosecution, to make it more effective, and to contextualize the prosecution of international crimes within domestic legal system. So following this brief introduction, I would like to analyze some of the current challenges of international criminal justice and how these challenges could be taken, considered in today's assessment of the implementation of the sanction system. In this case, implementation becomes an opportunity to adapt and innovate the Italian criminal justice system in line with the pluralism translated into the principle of complementarity, which underpins and limits the ICC system. At the same time, implementation is also an opportunity for the domestication of the ICC statute. So what can the Italian experience offer for the new challenges regarding international criminal justice? And how can we rethink a more effective system of sanctions? Within these more general questions, I will be focusing on one particular aspect. The implementation of the ICC statute could provide an opportunity to innovate the sanction system by designing additional or alternative forms of punishment. This is important in light of the current challenges that international criminal justice has to face, in particular those posed by the urgency of dealing with the climate crisis. 
This point requires to deal also with the relationship between criminal law and time, and especially between international criminal justice and the future. We hear the term future a lot in these difficult times when discussing the environmental crimes or the crime of ecocide. For instance, need to protect future generations or future damages. Allow me again to quote Mireille delmas marty who wrote, I'm quoting, who knows if tomorrow the monuments dedicated to the fallen in our squares will give way to monuments dedicated to future generations. This suggests that probably very soon the function of a global criminal law will be rooted as much in the construction of memory as of a common future. The future becomes the glue of the community as much as its memory, perhaps even more than memory. We all know that if we want to save the planet, we must stop and prevent the already ongoing phenomena with the potential to destroy, according to the Pope, our common home. International criminal justice could contribute with the already existing criminal offenses or the introduction of a new crime of ecocide. When it comes to ecocide, the protection of humanity and of the common home is no longer at the core of the discussion. Rather, the current challenge to address is the protection of humanity in its interdependence with the biosphere. Now, the awareness of the urgent need to deal with climate crisis should also be taken into consideration in the framing and defining sanctions. We should look for a holistic response, which includes both retributive and restorative justice. Rules for sanctioning could be the key to such integration. And that because rebuilding the future is not the primary and prevailing purpose of retributive justice, just, such as the ICC system, but rather of restorative forms of justice. On the contrary, retributive justice looks very much at the present and is directed at the past in accordance with its dependence on penalty. Restorative justice can be both backward looking and forward looking. These demonstrate that the need to respond to environmental crimes requires considerations on sanctions. Which sanctions can be adequate in front of this new temporality? Can criminal law accommodate this new temporality? If not, how can we integrate these forms within the Italian criminal justice system implementing or domesticating the statute? This question marks are significant also within the reflection on the execution of sentencing. The implementation of restorative and alternative forms of justice, less prison sentences, restore funds, reuse of traditional non-intensive non agricultural practices are already in line with the spirit of the ICC statute. It does not exclude these forms of justice. So to conclude my comments, these ideas are meant to stress how important it is on the one hand to take advantage of the intrinsic pluralism of the Rome system, and on the other hand, to flag the opportunity of domestic implementation for adapting international criminal justice in line with the statute of the ICC. And that beyond the punishment of all and through different channels of the execution at the execution level. So this reflection are underpinned by the question of the objectives of international punishment, which determines both the design and execution of sanctions. Rather than focusing on disillusionment and difficulties, we should remember the intrinsic inferior nature of international legal field and promote its evolution and adaptation. Even though 
Restorative justice and international criminal justice are frequently assigned to parallel universes, often even in conflict. These approaches coexist and tie these fields together with an interplay of broad and narrow, global and local. Indeed, we are dealing with two sides of the same coin. Defining the system of sanctions could be the right opportunity to start implementing an integrated approach that leverages the strengths of both fields, filling each other's gaps and complementing their roles. I thank you all for your attention and give back the floor to my chair. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this intervention. And uh, I now give the floor uh, to Professor Davide Galliani, uh, University of Milan. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much to all for the invitation. I would like to share some consideration on life imprisonment in the International Criminal Court. My premise is that we have to employ with the, the life sentence at least the same attention used about the death penalty. The first issue regards the use of life imprisonment. It is not normally used by international criminal courts. The second issue concerns a specific type of life sentence. After Nuremberg and Tokyo, international criminal courts did not use the death penalty and life imprisonment without parole or conditional release. In chronological order, life imprisonment has never been used by the International Criminal Court. In its 10 conviction, the ICC never used life imprisonment, never. If the ICC were to use a life sentence, after 25 years, the court will have to review life imprisonment to consider early release. Therefore, at the ICC, the life imprisonment without parole does not exist, and the life sentences review is always a judicial review ascribed to the same ICC. Life imprisonment has been used five times out of 161 proceedings by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Anyway, Life imprisonment is always with the possibility of early release. Life imprisonment has been used 16 times out of 93 proceedings by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Also in this case, life imprisonment is always with the possibility of early release. As known, the review of life sentence affirmed by both international tribunals is allocated to the mechanism for international criminal tribunals. This means that review is a judicial review or at least a quasi-judicial review. One of the most important cases resolved by the mechanism is Galic, who was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2006 by the YCTY after the appeal chamber modified the penalty of 20 years decided by the trial chamber with a strong dissent of Judge Pokar. The mechanism had to solve many problems. In Germany, where Galic was detained, lifers can ask for conditional release after 15 years. In 2015, the president of the mechanism was faced with a Gaelic request for early release. It was the first time that the mechanism dealt with a request for early release by a lifer. The prosecutor argued to reject it because between German law and the mechanism law, the second had to prevail and considering that for the mechanism law, the request for conditional release is available after two thirds of the penalty, 
The problem referred to life sentence, a penalty without fixed term, had to be resolved by coming up with an equivalent fixed term that could be reduced. The prosecutor taking into consideration the maximum penalty determined at the international level that was uh, 52 years in the CSA case decided in 2019 by the Special Court for Sierra Leone suggest, suggested to use this penalty. The MICT president disagreed as the Super Special Court for Sierra Leone used 52 years since life imprisonment had not been established as a sentence it could impose. Consequently, the president used the maximum penalty of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which was uh, 45 years in the Kajeljegli case of 2005. The president then compared life imprisonment to 45 years. The result was that lifers can ask for early release after 30 years, that is two thirds of 45 years. After this explanation for the president, the request advanced according to the national law must be considered by the mechanism. The conclusion in the Galich case was that early release was denied according to the seriousness of the crimes. The absence of collaboration with justice was defined as a neutral aspect. Going back, the special court for Sierra Leone could not use a life sentence. The special court could employ only a fixed term penalty. And from 1997 to date, life imprisonment has been used two times out of three cases by the extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia. In any case, in any case early release can be requested after 20 years. Regarding the extraordinary chambers, the Dutch case deserve uh, to be recalled. In 2012, the Supreme Court Chamber modified the penalty of 35 years decided by the trial chamber. The new penalty was life imprisonment. After the Supreme Court Chamber rejected the prosecutor request for life imprisonment without parole. The judges argued that despite no provision on parole in the extraordinary chamber rules, the Cambodian Penal Code provided for parole after 20 years. This brief report of a life sentences practice in the international criminal justice show that national parliaments have no full discretion to decide the penalties according to the crimes provided for the Rome Statute. There are two minimum requirements. First, life imprisonment must always be with the possibility of parole of early release. The second, the review of life imprisonment must always be a judicial review. Any hypothesis of political review must be set aside. Moreover, the Re European Court of Human Rights can usefully refer to this scenario, especially concerning the ICC not only about the possibility of a life sentences review after 25 years. It is relevant to underline that a review of a life sentence must be a judicial review. This is not a secondary argument. As long as we want to preserve life imprisonment, I repeat, as long as we want to preserve life imprisonment, the lesson by the international criminal justice is to allocate the review in the judges. And judges, not politicians, have the duty to give reasons for their decision. To be clear, in my opinion, in Italian, we cannot extend the ergastolo stativo, I don't know the correct translation 
uh, is a perpetual penalty um, who permit to exit from the prison only with collaboration with uh, justice. If not, uh, uh, we can say Houston, we have a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we are increasingly uh, running out of time. So I immediately invite um, uh, Professor Gorski, who is um, Gorski, who is uh, joining us from Krakow, uh, Jagiellonian University. So Adam, uh, we see that you have problem with video, but uh, we would like, uh, we are happy to hear you, of course. Uh, so Thank you. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I thought this meeting rather as a sharing some views in discussion than preparing a um, long time lecture. And I'd like to uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to join this very uh, distinguished uh, and wise society of, of scholars. Uh, I was thinking about this uh, discussion uh, or round table as I thought it as, um, as a comparison of uh, penal means in the domestic legal system of Poland and the Rome Statute, which of course is not very possible in full in such a um, brief uh, statement that I uh, want to give. So uh, um, starting from the some very uh, uh, general ideas uh, when you uh, read the uh, Rome Statute and the adjacent legal sources, like the rules of um, procedure. Of course, uh, we see uh, ahead the simplest uh, simplest sanctions system, uh, and was already described in many times. And what really catches the eye is what um, the, um, what was already ver said very thoroughly uh, very thorough, thoroughly described is that, that there is no normally no um, probation and uh, only the appeals chamber may apply reduction of sentence upon article 110 of the uh, statute and this reduction of sentence was applied rather rarely uh, in Lubanga case and uh, uh, denied, first of all, in Katanga uh, uh, case, with a federal prerequisite is for reduction of sentence foreseen in, in Section 5 uh, uh, of the Rules of Procedure and uh, Evidence. And uh, this is said to stress or underline that this uh, reduction of sentence has nothing to do with probation or giving a, a sentenced per person a, a try. Uh, and uh, also the de determination of sentence rules is uh, included in Article 77 of the statute and the, for most of all in the uh, rules of procedure and evidence in the Article 145 um, uh, uh, are uh, very strict and are not about uh, this problem of uh, probation, which may be uh, seemed, um, which may be regarded as obvious, but is not any more obvious when we look at the treatment of the ICC to the uh, crimes against uh, uh, the uh, administration of justice, where the problem of probation arose uh, in terms of the suspended uh, sentence. There, this problem arises, uh, uh, of course, whether the um, international criminal law should be changed with this regard because the crimes against administration of justice as described in Article 70 of the Rome Statutes are of a different kind and very different vi variety and gravity. So uh, the, now the question applies how far and is very strict and uh, very important, how far the above strict and several rules uh, of reduction of sentences show apply, which is still not an unanswered uh, question, not fully answered question. And uh, so uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, crimes against administration of justice, there were uh, efforts to suspend uh, sentences against the wording of the statute and the rules. 
and in uh, the cases surrounding uh, Bembar case at appeal uh, uh, at the appeal uh, uh, it was uh, um, very clearly claimed that the trial chamber's powers to suspend sentence are very uh, limited. So with this regard, it seems that even the recodification of the Article 70 might be, may be needed as a very special set of circumstances different from the Article uh, 5 set of circumstances. Uh, um, uh, I would like to shortly mention, although it doesn't have to do directly with uh, sentencing in terms of rules set uh, by the legislator uh, that the judges should stick to. But uh, interestingly, the, there was a, uh, and still is a very uh, uh, clear criminal um, uh, procedure problem with regard to crimes against administration of justice, that is to say the composition of panels, uh, where is normally, as a rule, there is a, a, a three judges panel in the trial chamber and five judges panel in the appeals uh, chamber. This rule was supposed to be changed as far as crimes against administration of justice are concerned. And uh, with this regard, as we Remember, a provisional rule was uh, set stating that the compos composition should be accordingly one judge, uh, one judge in trial chamber and three judges in the appeals uh, chamber, which was not uh, confirmed um, by the Assembly of States in the uh, proper appropriate time. So it was thought that silence with this regard was uh, uh, a confirmation which again was uh, denied by the uh, appeals chamber. So this is where still there is uh, much legislative space uh, as far as sentencing uh, in terms of uh, crimes against administration uh, of justice. So what, why, uh, while I first thought uh, I would, uh, uh, tell uh, just about the this this uh, domain, uh, this ICC problem uh, uh, concerning crimes against administration of justice. I uh, uh, sort of fell upon the problem of uh, uh, probation and the problem of um, uh, rules of uh, sentencing, and I will now shortly. Uh, uh, turn to the uh, Polish um, criminal law system with this uh, regard, uh, simply trying to compare the uh, probation uh, possibilities and mechanism uh, against the same uh, or almost the same crimes, crimes with the same gravity as those uh, codified in the Rome uh, statute. First of all, uh, I would like to um, uh, elucidate uh, very shortly that uh, there is one um, major um, in the article 53 of the um, Polish penal code we don't have a, an idea of Filka of Filka Staff Gesetzbuch uh, so uh, the composition the, the, the elements of crimes uh, international crimes are the same as the uh, domestic one there is uh, the, in, in the article 52 that uh, there is one major principle of, of sentencing that is to say uh, uh, the court uh, sentences uh, in the limits uh, uh, foreseen by the uh, by the statute however uh, the uh, severity of penalty cannot exceed the uh, the um, level of guilt, so which uh, um, primarily there was there wasn't such a rule in the Polish criminal code. It may be regarded as a uh, newly introduced rule to the uh, criminal code in terms of uh, in the intro its introduction in the new criminal uh, uh, code and uh, further. Uh, what shall be taken into account uh, mm, with regard to 
uh, rules of sentencing is uh, is the uh, circumstance of committing crime jointly with a minor, the kind and extent of imposed duties, uh, kind and extent of uh, negative consequences of crime, uh, attributes and personal conditions of the perpetrator, uh, art and way of living before committing crime and um, behavior after committing, after the commission, uh, especially efforts to uh, of restitu restitution of harm or social feeling of justice. Uh, so uh, going uh, back to the uh, crimes against uh, humanity and the core crimes and its equivalents in the Polish uh, uh, court, uh, in the Polish uh, criminal code. Uh, mm, almost all the equivalents are uh, uh, of the core crimes are in, endangered either with uh, alternative penalty of 25 years uh, of imprisonment or life uh, sentence, or uh, mm, with uh, with a, uh, a custodial sentence also, uh, which mm, which turns us to look at the uh, peril and uh, suspension possibilities with the same uh, crimes as in the ICC core crimes. Mm, a case and here, uh, as far as peril is concerned, there, uh, as far uh, as far as twenty-five years imprisonment was applied or introduced, sentenced, uh, peril may uh, be uh, given after fifteen years of uh, imprisonment, and as far as life uh, imprisonment is uh, concerned, peril may be granted after 25 years of uh, life uh, imprisonment, which uh, with custodial sentence, so to say normal custodial sentence, uh, parole may be given uh, after two thirds uh, of serving the uh, uh, penalty imposed. So we see, of course, as in almost many, almost every other country uh, that uh, this um, possibility of uh, suspending or paroling is much wider than in this strict international criminal law and uh, procedure. And of course, going back for a little while, while to the... Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, we, we, we are out of time completely. Okay. Could, could you please conclude? Because anyway, we, we need time for questions. Okay, then uh, of course we uh, there is also a, a specific rule um, uh, of sentencing against uh, minors uh, and juveniles, which is the uh, 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 which is the aim of uh, still uh, um, upbringing uh, this uh, person. So in this case, the life sentence uh, uh, normally is rather uh, excluded. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and I immediately uh, give the floor uh, to uh, Dr. Um, Alice Riccardi, um, uh, University of Rome. Uh, the floor is yours. Please be also with the, within seven minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me first of all, of course, thank Chantal Meloni and uh, Professor uh, Gisberge and of course Maria Grippa for uh, for having invited me here uh, at the outset. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So at the outset, um, I want to disclose immediately that I am among those who believe that the international criminal law sentencing system abundantly proved to be unique. 
And I also believe that in some selected areas, a consistent sentencing practice has emerged. So now, this disclosed, um, among the areas of reflection proposed by the organizers in the concept note, uh, I will attempt to answer to the question whether an international analogy would work. In other terms, whether the transplantation of international sentencing practice into the domestic may take place and according to which methodology. Uh, in brief, uh, I anticipate that I will maintain that should a general principle of international criminal law concerning sentencing be detected, then a known mechanical importation or transposition of such principle into the domestic shall be pursued. I guess the limited time that I have at my disposal, I will use one example that I hope may be illustrative of such methodology of transplantation and also constructive in light of the aims of this colleague. Now, back in 2003, we all know that the ICTY trial chamber in the Nikolic D case uh, decided to accept the accused uh, guilty plea in mitigation in contrast to national legal system, uh, where the mitigating effect of a guilty plea is limited to known serious crimes. According to the judges in international criminal proceedings, guilty pleas must instead be accepted in mitigation since by pleading guilty accused persons, and I quote, take an important step in the rehabilitation and reintegration process. In particular, the trial chamber affirmed that international criminal, in international criminal proceedings, rehabilitation requires to accept a guilty plea insofar as it shows the willingness of the offender to appease the consequences of the crimes, to attain reconciliation in the affected community, and to promote the international rule of law. In the past, I have referred to this idea as in internationalized rehabilitation in the sense that international criminal courts and tribunals deduced from the international legal system an understanding of rehabilitation consonant with the specificities of international criminality. This rationale was then translated into several rules, including, as in the example I just offered to you, the acceptance of guilty pleas in, in mitigation, but not only. For instance, the same rationale underpinned the progressive expansion by the two UN tribunals of the catalog of mitigating circumstances as to include expression of remorse, expression of regret, even partial acceptance of responsibility by the accused person, cooperation, of course, with the office of the prosecutor. As time passed by, the two tribunals is, insisted even more on the restorative aspect of the rationale of internationalized rehabilitation and looked in mitigation at circumstances, of, uh, circumstances such as uh, acts of post-conduct crimes, so acts of assistance towards the victims, participation in peace processes, surrender, prevention of others from committing crimes, dissemination of a culture of respect for the international rule of law. I have no time now to delve also into the ICC system, but I see it going in a very similar direction, both uh, through its positive law and initial practice. Now, against this background, we may therefore ask ourselves, or at least I asked myself, whether a general principle of law formed within the international criminal legal system, whereby vis-a-vis -vis international crimes, rehabilitation, but more in general rationals of sentencing, shall be read through internationalized lenses. And the main characteristics of general principles of international law suggest that this question may be answered in the positive. Indeed, internationalized rehabilitation first fits the commonly accepted definition of general principles as gen, I'm, of course, I'm quoting Kolb, but this is not my words, of course, as general propositions considered to be expressive of the ratio of a series of more detailed rules. Second, uh, ICT, uh, International Criminal Tribunal's judges inferred such a principle through a process of deduction from existing conventional and customary international law, which the principle underlies. And also such a principle as being considered inherent to the fundamental features and the basic requirements of international criminal justice. Uh, third, it has always been invoked um, to fulfill an auxiliary function. Um, so it was used either to produce new rules that uh, didn't find in the absence of other indication from customary or conventional law, uh, such as in the case of guilty pleas, or to interpret existing rules. Now I don't have time to go into such examples, uh, so I will cut here, but if you want, we will discuss it further. Now, 
a few agree with me, I don't know, that internationalized rehabilitation is a general principle of international criminal law. It remains to be seen whether it can be transposed domestically and how. As to whether many reasons support a positive answer, first and foremost, because rules of general international law enter, we said it many times during these two days, enter the Italian legal system pursuant to the mobile rembois operated by Article 10 of the Constitution. Second, because such principle is does not contrast with our fundamental values, rather the opposite, uh, reinforces Article uh, 27 of the Constitution. And uh, third, because as a general principle, our principle is adaptable in any case to the features of the legal system in which it is imported. And here I come to the how transposition may work. Um, the principle, uh, uh, our uh, internationalized rehabilitation principle would in other terms function as a tool to ensure conformity between its interpretation in the international legal system, in the legal system of origin, and the manner in which a legislation on international crimes is to be enacted domestically. And these, in turn, should smoothen tensions inherent to legal pluralism by ensuring a minimum openness, conversation among legal orders and precluding them, as Bouters put it, from living in clinical isolation. So in conclusion, I believe that the status of international sentencing law is not as embryonic as it was, well, when I started my PhD at least, <laughs> or in any case, back when the tribunals were established, and that the general principle of international criminal law whereby sentencing determination shall catch the specificities of international criminality as emerged. National legislation shall take this into account when drafting a code of international crimes and formulate rules that are consonant with the internationalized uh, sentencing principle. Uh, when it comes to the example of mitigating circumstances that are focused on today, this may entail the um, introduction of a list of circumstances tailored to international criminal proceedings. But I leave it to the criminal lawyers uh, to tell us the specificities of how should it work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for this uh, intervention. Uh, and um, now we come to, to the point when we can uh, discuss uh, uh, the presentations. Unfortunately, uh, I'm afraid that we have time just for a few quick questions. Uh, and first, I would like to, to, to see the online participants. Anybody uh, would like to raise? Okay, uh, I see none. And uh, so I turn to the audience <laughs> in Milan. So, if I may, uh, thank you for the interesting presentations. Uh, I'm not an expert in criminal law and even less in sanctions, but uh, I was wondering uh, the adoption of uh, a, an international criminal code in Italy. Uh, taking into account all what was said by Dr. Fronza, by David, by Alice, uh, shouldn't that lead? Well, first of all, uh, as a non-expert, uh, it seems to me that there are some problems in the Italian legal system with regard to the sanctioning system. But anyway, shouldn't that lead to a, a, a reform of the whole uh, sanctioning system in Italy in order to have a balance between sanctions for international crimes and sanction for ordinary crimes. Thank you. So it was the question for many participants, I believe. So uh, for at least for Italian scholars, uh, any 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 other question? Just to pick uh, to pick other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great presentation. And my question goes to Paolo and Emanuela. I really liked your proposition of engaging more with restorative sanctions. And I was wondering how exactly that could look like in practice. And I think Manuela mentioned some examples. And it's, I guess, easier to conceptualize if you look at crimes like destroying cultural property or environmental crimes. But if you look at crimes like genocide or, let's say, crimes against humanity and so on, 
is there any way that you could link this to the Italian criminal code? I mean, thinking of the German criminal code, for instance, we only have one restorative mode of sanctioning, which is like victim offender mediation practice. Do you have something you could link this to already? And would it always be like, a, could it serve as really an alternative to a prison sentence? Or would it also always be like an add-on, like something like, let's say, reparation in addition to criminal accountability through retributive prison sentencing? Thank you. I think one more question is possible <laughs> in this very, very tense situation. So if, if none, I give uh, the floor to the speakers, Yay. just uh, who wants to start and uh, briefly address these questions. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I don't think that I can actually <laughs> answer your question because um, uh, I am also not an expert at all in Italian sentencing law, but um, from what I understood, um, the system already has differentiates between different uh, crimes and their gravity. And um, from what I saw, it would be possible at least to introduce uh, a code again uh, of crimes against international law um, without reforming the whole uh, 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 sanctions and sentencing provisions, but if there are <laughs> uh, qualified uh, speakers who um, disagree, then I'm very interested to learn how, how you think about it. You maybe, yeah, I. Okay, Paola. Okay, uh, thank you, Leoni, for your for your question. Well, of course, there is not <laughs> one uh, rigid uh, and clear answer that I can give. Um, uh, um, as I was saying, vi um, victim offender mediation is uh, currently having a growing interest in Italy, also because of the particular interest of the current minister, uh, and uh, we have a growing role in the future. I think this could be one example of a tool that we can use. Um, I think the Colombia model in particular show us that restorative justice and retributive justice cannot, uh, in, in such circumstances, cannot be seen as alternative. Um, and it also, it is, I think, an example of how the classical idea of peace versus justice should be Overcome. I mean, I like I, um, I like the idea of the philosopher Albert Campagna, who uh, who says that it's it's not true that this the peace is versus justice because if we look at social contract theories, the state has at the same not only an obligation of justice which refers to the past, but also an obligation to protect the citizens from future violation of human rights. So this can be at the uh, seen as, as justice in a forward-looking perspective. So I think it won't be, it will be impossible to provide for a, a general formula like, uh, I don't know, like mediation as an alternative to sentence at all, but probably uh, there are some, some mixed, mixed models. And I think in particular, this could come at play if in cases of, for example, Italian tribunals judging congats uh, committed abroad. I mean, for example, if the um, Italian judges should be called to judge uh, congats committed in Colombia, uh, sh should not play a role the fact that probably the offender agrees at the same time to be involved or that that country has chosen a different path which is not limited to uh, to retributive justice. I think it should at least play a role. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I can say in general uh, there should be no sentence at, at all, but it should play at least a role in the decision process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Franza, please, uh, could you briefly? Thanks, Professor Bokbush. Yes, I think uh, Paolo has already answered a little bit to your question, to your open question. That is my answer, is an open question. Of course, Leonie, thanks for uh, uh, stress, for stressing this point. I think 
uh, as I said in my, in my conclusion, we have to think uh, uh, that we are dealing with two sides of the same coin. So maybe, um, maybe in addition, both for common core crimes and even for what I call so these new challenges for international criminal justice, namely ecocide or environmental crimes. Thank you. Yeah, what? Other? Yes, can. So we, I think we 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 come to 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 the point when we have to conclude this session, since we don't have any. We don't have actually time, so it's uh, it's uh, it's time to to conclude. So unfortunately, uh, the, the the poor discipline of uh, our collective, I uh, mean, uh, did not let us the opportunity to 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 discuss all the questions, all the issues that have been raised in the presentations. But I thank everybody. I think it was extremely. Uh, extremely rich uh, uh, presentations uh, and a lot of ideas about uh, uh, sanction and sentencing and international criminal law and uh, in, uh, in the context of domestication. I think all participants um, uh, to this uh, of this discussion, but also listeners in Milan and uh, online in different, in different uh, parts of the world, uh, I wish uh, everybody a nice evening uh, and uh, enjoy <laughs> enjoy dinner. And uh, I think uh, it would be great to see uh, everybody tomorrow in uh, also online or offline. Thank you very much, and um, um, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, we have a final intervention by um, Dr. Angela Colella. She is a um, judge at the Criminal Tribunal of Monza. As anticipated this morning, she will focus on um, the judicial applications of the um, crime of torture into the Italian legal system. Angela, if you want. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, these days I didn't have time to prepare my speech in English, so I do apologize for that. A translation will follow. So just um, a very, very synthetic, okay. So, um, dopo l'introduzione dell'articolo 613 bis del codice penale nel 2017, Direi che la partita dell'ottemperanza dello Stato italiano agli obblighi di criminalizzazione e persecuzione penale della tortura mi pare si sia spostata sul piano interpretativo. Eh, la norma è stata molto criticata, è caratterizzata da vistose ambiguità, ridondanze, sembrava addirittura era stato messo in dubbio che potesse essere applicata nei rapporti verticali, quindi eh, nelle ipotesi di tortura di Stato. In effetti per i primi due anni dall'introduzione della norma non si sono registrate, almeno per quel che riguarda i casi assurdi all'onore delle cronache, eh, applicazioni nei rapporti verticali, ma soltanto nei rapporti orizzontali. Nel 2019 però si sono avute invece le prime applicazioni nei rapporti verticali, ci sono state delle ordinanze cautelari, eh, GIP presso il Tribunale di Siena prima, poi presso il Tribunale di Torino, e eh, eh, presso il Tribunale di Piacenza hanno dimostrato in qualche modo che questa norma può eh, trovare eh, applicazione anche in questo tipo di rapporti. Ehm, il punto è mh, però che ehm, ci sono alcuni snodi interpretativi che meritano eh, di essere affrontati nel futuro. Eh, per il momento non ci sono eh, arresti di legittimità eh, che hanno messo un punto definitivo insomma, su, sulle questioni sul tappeto. Ci sono pochissime sentenze, tutte rese dalla Cassazione ehm, in fase cautelare. Eh, quindi direi che la partita è ancora in corso. Mi sembra che 
ehm, la norma che è stata introdotta nel codice penale italiano sia idonea a reprimere fatti analoghi a quegli oggetto delle sentenze della Corte Europea che hanno dato un fondamentale impulso alla sua introduzione, mi riferisco alla sentenza Cestaro, Bartesaglie Gallo, Blair, Azzolina e le altre che si sono susseguite, a patto però che i giudici nazionali facciano un uso corretto degli strumenti ermeneutici a loro disposizione. In particolare mi sembra che il punto cruciale sia quello dell'interpretazione della fattispecie di cui al comma 2, che riguarda proprio il caso in cui i fatti di tortura siano commessi da un pubblico ufficiale o un incaricato di pubblico servizio con abuso dei poteri o violazione di doveri inerenti alle funzioni al servizio, come fattispecie autonoma di reato e non come circostanza aggravante. Eh, perché soltanto questo tipo di interpretazione potrebbe sottrarre questa fattispecie eh, al giudizio di bilanciamento con circostanze attenuanti di segno opposto. Eh, è una soluzione che mi sembra imposta appunto dall'obbligo eh, di interpretazione eh, conforme a Costituzione, alle norme eh, sovranazionali, articolo 3 c in testa, ma ovviamente non è, non è la sola. Ehm... E eh, al momento non è l'interpretazione adottata dalla Cassazione, dicevo però si sono registrate soltanto pochissime pronunce sul punto, credo che ci sia il tempo per rimeditare questo eh, orientamento. Grazie molte. I think we can um, have a translation for the benefit of those non speaking Italian, if someone is interested. Um, however, thank you very much, Angela, for your presentation on the judicial application and possible future developments of Article 613 bis of the Criminal Code. Um, I will try to summarize for those of you who don't speak Italian. Um, as we said this morning, the problem with this provision is the second part and uh, its possible consideration as aggravating circumstance or autonomous crime. Um, as Dr. Colella was saying before, we don't have a final judgment by the Court of Cassations on, on that, uh, but still we have some precautionary orders, uh, for example, by the Tribunal of Turin, Siena, and Piacenza um, that can set a compliance with Article 3 of the European um, Convention on Human Rights and um, of course solve the, the problem of this uh, second part of the, of the norm. Uh, in this sense, it seems that this crime can be applied also in vertical um, relationships and not only between privates. I think this summarized your, your intervention. Not... Okay, thank you very much.